Welcome to Practice Intimacy. This is the place to be to learn all about love, sex, and how to have the best relationships you possibly can. My name is Jamie Lynn. I'm a marriage and family therapist in the Austin area, and I am here today to lead you through a little bit of education and a practice surrounding self-compassion. We're going to talk about what self-compassion is. I'm going to explain to you why it is so helpful to begin practicing and how it can actually begin to shape your life in a different way. Not only shape your life, but really change your brain so that your life becomes different. And then I'll share a practice with you that is thousands of years old. People have been doing it for so long and people still do it today. There's even been research into it now and the effect that it has on folks whenever they do this practice. So stick around to the end for that. And remember to like this video, subscribe to my channel if you want information about sex, love, romantic relationships. I really appreciate your support. So let's get started. Self-compassion. Ah, this is such a wonderful topic. I love the topic of self-compassion because it is not something we're often taught. Usually this is a culture that is very much like based in puritanical, patriarchal thoughts. Uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, people are inherently sinful by nature, all of these things that are part of our like cultural learning. I live in the U.S. It's part of our cultural learning and it affects us in ways that we don't understand or even notice most of the time and still until you start doing practices that shift your orientation to the world and yourself self-compassion practices, they've been around truly for thousands of years. There are recordings of Buddhist teaching, Tantra teaching, a lot of Eastern philosophy teaching really, that have self-compassion built into those philosophies. Often it's like talking about in terms of non-judgment, um, but you can even find loving kindness practices more recently, there is a researcher who brought self-compassion more into the forefront of our common knowledge. Uh, her name is Kristen Neff. She is a researcher as well as a professor. And she's been talking about self-compassion for the last couple of decades. She's been doing research into how it affects people, how they can practice it. And she has some really beautiful definitions that I'm going to share with you because I think it's helpful to have an understanding of what self-compassion is. One of the first things she says is that compassion, compassion in general, whether it's towards others or yourself, is allowing yourself to feel warmth, tenderness, kindness towards people who are suffering. And it could be big suffering, it could be smaller suffering. So like small suffering is my partner's hurt and cannot work out. And I'm feeling some compassion towards their sadness about their body being hurt and about losing a practice that feels important to them. More extreme example might be when I'm driving and I see a homeless person and feeling compassion towards their suffering, living out on the streets, not knowing whether or not they're going to eat tonight often being looked at as though they are criminals or undeserving of existence, really, and feeling compassion towards what it must be like to be in that experience. There are so many other examples, but those, those kind of hit some of the spectrum. When it comes to self-compassion, you're really directing the warmth towards yourself. You're wishing yourself more no, not wishing. You're interacting with yourself from a place of more kindness and care rather than criticism, harshness, put downs. And what Kristen Neff says is that there are three elements to self-compassion and I'll just list them real quick, but then I'm going to break each one down a little bit. So it's self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. And with that first one, she talks about it as self-kindness over self-criticism. So, so often people, we mess up in some way and the first thing that happens is what one of my mentors, Kristen, um, Kristen Marie Sweeting, she calls it the bitchety cricket, the little voice in the back of your mind. And I love that name for it, the bitchety cricket, who's saying like, 
I can't believe you haven't done the laundry yet. I can't believe that you said that thing to your coworker. I can't believe that you haven't lost 10 pounds yet. Whatever the thing that's happening in your mind that is critical of yourself and what you've done and the way you've acted, that is the opposite of self-compassion. That is the very thing that we're trying to change when we start a self-compassion practice. And so many people have this little bitchy cricket voice in their mind. If you are feeling willing to talk about your bitchy cricket, please leave a comment. Say some things that go on in your mind whenever you are kind of harsh to yourself. It'll help other people start to really reflect on their own mind and see what they say to themselves. And so the definition that Kristen gives for self-kindness is meeting yourself with warmth and understanding when you are suffering, when you fail, when you feel inadequate, rather than ignoring that pain or moving into self-criticism. And I love her word choice here. It's not just about the times whenever you're suffering or you're in some sort of pain. So like if you're worried about your bank account you're worried that you're not going to have enough money this month to cover all your bills. That's more of the suffering and pain experience. But a different side of that would be telling yourself that you're not good enough because you're not making as much money as you wanted. That would fall more into this category of like failing or believing that you failed, believing that you're inadequate in some way because you haven't made the money that you want to make. And that is as painful as the actual suffering. The anxiety about like, oh shit, am I going to be able to afford groceries? Sorry, that's one of the first times that I've cussed on here, I think. It'll probably slip out more. <laughs> I'm human too. Here we go. <laughs> um, but then there's all the things we tell ourselves about ourselves in those moments whenever something's not going in the way we would hope. And we need self-compassion for that as much as we need self-compassion for unpleasant situations that are absolutely going to occur because this is life. It is imperfect. It is difficult. There will always be things that are challenging about it. And sometimes it can be easy to be self-compassionate if like something does not go your way. If say you lose your job, it might be easy for you to be self-compassionate. Like, oh man, 60 other people were let go too. This isn't my fault. I'm not a failure, but this still sucks. Oof, so hard. But if instead you've tried to build a business and that does not work and you start calling yourself a failure, that requires a different kind of self-compassion. It can be a little bit more challenging to move into that space if you're judging yourself harshly rather than just recognizing that you're in a painful situation. I hope that distinction is helpful. In the end, you need self-compassion for both, but it can often be harder for people whenever they're judging themselves as inadequate in some way. The next element of self-compassion is common humanity. And Kristen Neff talks about this as common humanity versus isolation. There are times whenever we think we are the only ones who are experiencing these feelings or we are the only ones who have ever messed up in this particular way, when in truth, that is not the case. When it comes to common humanity, what we're really doing is recognizing that suffering and personal inadequacy is part of the shared human experience. Everyone goes through those types of experiences at some time or other in their life. Every single person on this planet will experience some form of suffering and pain or internal criticism about themselves. And so having a compassion practice helps you come into a space where you recognize that you are not alone in your suffering. You are not alone in your painful feelings. Other people go through sometimes the same, sometimes very similar experiences to what you're going through. And by doing that, you just remove the feeling of aloneness, which is actually huge because we are relational creatures and whenever we feel isolated and alone, that is when trauma experiences actually happen, any kind of trauma experience. That is also when depression begins to creep in, as well as physical ailments. Our body actually becomes sick whenever we feel isolated and alone. 
And so shared humanity is a really large part of learning how to be more compassionate towards others and yourself. And then the third element, the last element that Kristin Neff talks about is mindfulness over, or mindfulness rather than over identification. And what she means by this is taking a balanced approach to our negative emotions without suppressing or exaggerating them. It is impossible to move through this life without some negative emotions. And often people either tend to avoid the negative feelings, push them down, suppress them, or get caught up in the storm of the negative feelings and totally believe that they're true, over identify with them and send themselves into an even worse experience of the negative emotions rather than having a balanced experience. So let me try and come up with an example of this. Let's go with that example of losing a job. If you were to lose a job, I'm thinking for myself, there was one time whenever I did not get a job that I really wanted and a part of me got swept up in the negative emotions. I am not good enough. They don't like me. I had been working at this job for a while and then I applied to continue working there and they said, no, no, thank you. We're gonna hire someone else. They don't like me. I'm not good enough. And so I'm getting swept up in these big negative thoughts rather than having a more balanced perspective about it. This sucks. I really wanted the job. It's not the end of the world. I will find another job. It does not mean anything about my personal relationship with these people. I actually still really like all of them. I believe they also like me. And I'm also not the best fit. For whatever reason, I'm not a good fit. That would be a more balanced perspective rather than getting swept up in all the feelings. I notice that my hands do a little tornado whenever I think about getting swept up in negative feelings, but that's truly what it feels like. It feels like a storm inside of you. And it's just taking you higher and higher up into this horrible internal space where everything feels bad and you believe you're never gonna get out of it. When in truth, all things pass and the negative experience will not last forever. So why does it matter? Why would it be important to start building a self-compassion practice into your daily routine? Or even just like your routine, it doesn't have to be daily. Daily will make it stick more quickly, but if you were to just practice this occasionally when you have time, that is also going to be helpful. And as always, there's two different ways to practice. There's the informal practice where just in your life, in any moment, if you have an opportunity to do self-compassion, do it. And then there's the more formal practice where you intentionally set aside time to do the practice. And that's what I'm gonna teach you today. I'm gonna to give you more of a formal practice that you can do, but that'll come in a moment. Let's talk about why it's important first. When you can be in self-compassion instead of criticism, you're turning on parts of the brain that downregulate your nervous system. So think about judgment and criticism happening in the lower parts of the brain, the subcortical area, what you probably have often call, heard called either the lizard brain or the limbic system. Self-criticism creates a neurochemical experience in that part of the brain. It lights up the amygdala, it lights up the parts of us that are experiencing the possibility of threat, because if I am bad, if I messed up, if I am a failure, then there is a part of me that's going to experience that as threat. My brain is literally going to pick that up as danger to my system. And so it's going to upregulate my nervous system. It's going to cause more stress in my body. It's going to release cortisol in my body. Whereas if you can move into a compassionate state, you're lighting air, you're lighting up areas of the prefrontal cortex, the forwardmost part of our brain. And when you turn on this part of the brain, it actually inhibits the subcortical area. It can send GABA into your brain and nervous system and it down regulates, it calms everything, it soothes. And it feels obvious to say this, but 
one experience is definitely preferable over the other. I would much rather have the experience of down-regulated nervous system, calm, kindness towards myself than feeling dysregulated, feeling negative towards myself, being internally critici critis critical. But then the less obvious reasons to do that would be because you will be a kinder person. You will move through the world with more care towards yourself and others, and that affects everyone. That affects the people you love, that affects children that you have or might have in the future. That affects the random people you bump into throughout your day. You'll be helping to create a kinder world. And so let me share the practice with you. This is a Buddhist practice, it's Buddhist meditation. In Pali, they call it metta, metta meditation. And then the way that we talk about it, often you might hear the words loving kindness meditation. And there are many different iterations. There are so many different ways people say this, but they tend to have a similar handful of words. And the one I've been using for years because I read about it in research is, may you be happy, may you be well, may you be safe, may you be peaceful and at ease. And what I suggest doing with this meditation is sitting for about 10 minutes and repeating the words to yourself and directing them at yourself. And, and people do this in one of two ways. So I typically say, may I be happy, may I be well, may I be safe, may I be peaceful and at ease. But if it's easier for you to think of yourself and direct the words to yourself and say, may you be happy, may you be well, may you be safe, then do it that way. Either one is totally fine. If this is really hard for you, then there is a way to kind of scale through easier to more challenging. And I wanna lead you through that scale. I personally had to do this for myself because self-compassion was a challenging practice. It isn't as much today, although it can be. But for me, it was really, really hard to do initially. And so I had to start with the easiest level, choosing an innocent other for whom you can do the meta meditation. And so I, I would often choose either like a tree or an animal that was in my life or once my friends started having babies then a baby that was in my life and I would just picture the innocent other and in my mind or out loud sometimes it's easier to say out loud because that can keep you in the experience a little bit more especially if you're somebody who struggles to do meditation then having a more active meditation would be helpful and picturing the baby and just saying may you be happy May you be well, may you be safe, may you be peaceful and at ease. And then after an innocent other, you move to somebody who is easy to care about. I started thinking about my best friends. They're really easy to care about and I would do the meditation for them. And then move to somebody who's a little bit more complicated. So somebody that you care about but you also have conflict with that could be a partner, that could be a parent, that could be a coworker, really anyone that you have mixed feelings towards. Sometimes you care about them deeply, sometimes it's hard to be in care for them. And then after that complicated person, you move towards somebody that it's actually really challenging to be compassionate for. For a long time, my person was Donald Trump. Choose your person. <laughs> anyone that you find really challenging, um, in the research, I've heard this described as like, pick an enemy, pick somebody that you think of as an enemy and do the compassion meditation for them. And then after that person, then do it for yourself. That is the progression from easy to challenging. And can we just take a moment and feel what it's like to recognize like, oh yeah, yeah, it's easier at times to be compassionate and wish compassion towards an enemy than to wish compassion towards myself. That is actually true for a lot of people. So if that is true for you, do not worry. That was also my experience with this. I was wishing kind, 
kindness and peacefulness towards others <laughs> and then working towards myself. And then actually, whenever I finally reached myself, I started with me as a young person, about like three or four, and then me today. So you can even break that up a little bit to make it easier. Whew, this felt like a long one. I hope you enjoyed. I hope that you take this and try it. Try practicing. See what it does for you. I'm going to link a few of Kristen Neff's resources below as well. She has some wonderful resources on her website. She also has two books. I have not read the newest one, but her old one, Self Compassion, is great. Um, and then I'm also going to link my Instagram account. I have a whole series on self-compassion where I lead you through different meditations. So you can do the practice with me if you would like. Remember to hit the like button, subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in future videos. Bye for now. Thank you.